I think the most important thing to recognize about fluoride is that it's extremely toxic. It is very active biologically, interfering with many basic biochemical processes, uh, enzymes, G proteins, hydrogen bonds, and so on. So it shouldn't surprise us that there's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. But the bottom line is that fluoride is extremely active biologically, that the first opponents of fluoridation going back to the 1950s were biochemists, inclu including scientists like James Sumner, who won a, a Nobel Prize for enzyme chemistry. And incidentally, there is no doubt that fluoride damages health because millions of people in India, China, and parts of Africa have had their health ruined by fluoride. The people have been crippled by fluoride and many other health effects. The argument as far as fluoridation is concerned is, is there an adequate margin of safety between the doses which cause this known harm and incidentally documented in this report by the National Research Council published in 2006. Here in a fairly independent balanced panel looked at the literature for three years and in this 507 page report and 1100 references indicated that the EPA safe drinking water standard for fluoridation, for fluoride, is four parts per million, it's not safe, it's not protective of health, and needs to be lowered. But before I get into the health effects, let me explain my first concern, which remains my top concern. The level of fluoride in mother's milk, mother's breast milk, baby's first meal, is extremely low. It's 0 .004 parts per million. That means a bottle-fed baby in a fluoridated community in the United States, where we fluoridate the water at one part per million, is getting 250 times higher dose of fluoride than a breastfed baby. And that is extremely disturbing. This is a hazardous waste. No question about it. It's not only hexafluorosilicic acid, but it's a lot of crap that Neil was talking about. It's got lead and arsenic and mercury and radioactive uh, isotopes, maybe trace amounts, they can't dump that into the sea by international law. They can't dump it locally because it's too concentrated. But wait for it. If someone buys it from them, it's, it, it, you take away the label hazardous waste and, and it becomes a product. It becomes a product. And who's going to buy this stuff from them? Oh, our water department. So the water departments buy this hazardous waste, it becomes a product, and now they put it in our drinking water. And now, let me go through the list of health concerns. Some of them are more certain than others. Let me begin with the certain one. Dental fluorosis. Fluoride causes a discoloration, mottling of the tooth enamel. When this practice began in 1945, the promoters of fluoridation thought they could limit dental fluorosis to 10% of the children in its very mild form. And the very mild form has little specks of, of uh, white, opaque patches on the cusp of the teeth, up to 25%. And they thought that only dentists would notice this. And was an acceptable trade-off with what they thought would be a lowering of tooth decay. Well, in November of 2010, the Center of Disease Control told us that children aged 12 to 15 in the United States, 41% of them now have dental fluorosis. And not only the very mild, but the mild, which impacts up to 50% of the tooth surface, moderate, which impacts up to 100% of the tooth surface, and severe, where you not only have the whole surface impacted, but indentations, chipping of the teeth, and so on. And 3.6% of children aged 12 to 15 in the United States have either moderate or severe dental fluorosis. So that, that trade-off between lowering tooth decay and um, producing dental fluorosis but holding it only to 10% clearly was a failure. We have four times more dental fluorosis as intended and as desired. 
Our attitude is that when you see this dental fluorosis, it means the child has been overexposed to fluoride, and the question is what other tissues have been affected. So let's start with the bone, because the teeth are a window into the bone. In fact, the teeth actually grow out of the, the jaw, the jaw bone. And by the time the permanent teeth have come out, the jaw bone has been loaded up with fluoride. And so if you can see the damage to the growing tooth cells, what did the fluoride do to the growing bone cells during this 8, 9, 10 period? In fact, the first study that was published on this in 55 indicated that the children in the fluoridated community, which was Newburgh, New York, had twice as much uh, cortical bone defects as the children in the non-fluoridated community. Now, the cortical bone is the outside layer of the bone and that's the layer it's a lamellar structure and that part of the bone is meant to protect against fractures and so the, the the concern then is whether we're increasing bone fractures in children well we had to wait until 2001 before someone investigated this and the researchers in mexico found a linear a correlation as the severity of dental fluorosis went up meaning the amount of fluoride the child had been exposed to before the permanent teeth had erupted. As that went up, so did bone fractures in the children. And it was quite striking. When you go from no dental fluorosis to very mild dental fluorosis, it doubled. The, the bone fractures doubled. Very mild to mild, doubled again. Mild to moderate, doubled again. The next concern about bone is that the first symptoms of bone poisoning in an adult are just like arthritis, uh, stiff joints, pains in the joints, pains in the bone. In the United States, we have one in three adults now with some form of arthritis. And if you ask a doctor what's causing it, um, they will say, well, we don't really know, but we think it's got something to do with aging. Well, what also parallels aging, of course, is the number of years you spent in a fluoridated community. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, eventually 60, 70, and so on. The next concern is, is as the fluoride continues to build up in the bone, and I should say that up to 50% of all the fluoride that we take in each day accumulates in the bone. The fluoride is bioaccumulative. Um, the bones get more brittle. And another major concern is increased hip fractures in adults. A study is done in China as documented in this National Research Council report and we further elaborated in our book, The Case Against Fluoride, indicates that levels as low as three milligrams per day, that's three liters of fluoridated water per day, may increase hip fractures in the elderly. Now my major concern is not the bones, although I think that's significant. My major concern is the brain, because when the baby is born, the blood-brain barrier is not fully formed. We think the blood-brain barrier keeps fluoride out of the brain most of the time, but for the first half year of the baby's life, the fluoride can get into the brain. And this is not the time, in my view, and the view of many other scientists, that a baby should be exposed to fluoride at 250 times the level in mother's milk. There have now been over 100 animal studies which shows that fluoride damages the brain. There have also been 23 IQ studies, most of them from China, but one from India, one from Iran, and one from Mexico, which show an association between moderate exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ in children. And I actually vi visited the villages where one of these studies was done. It was a very good study. They controlled for lead. They controlled for iodine. The, most of the, uh, the villages were almost The two villages were almost identical, except for the fact that their well water was different. And the author of this study estimated that the f IQ would be lowered at 1.9 parts per million. And that offers no adequate margin of safety for children drinking water at one parts per million when you consider the massive range of sensitivity to any toxic effect and the fact that once you put fluoride in the water you can't control the dose. Another concern which many of us have had for many years is fluoride's impact on the thyroid gland. 
For between the 30s and the 50s, doctors in Argentina, France, and Germany were giving patients with hyperthyroidism, overactive thyroid gland, sodium fluoride tablets to lower thyroid function. And the doses that they were using were between 2.5 and 4.5 milligrams per day, which is exceeded by many people drinking fluoridated water. For example, the Institute of Medicine actually advises people to drink three liters of water a day. So clearly then they would be in the range for lowered thyroid function. And once again, as in many of these other issues, the fluoridating countries, including the United States, are simply not doing the studies. They're not investigating to see if there's a relationship between fluoridation and lowered IQ, fluoridation and arthritis, fluoridation and hyperthyroidism. Key health studies have not been done in fluoridated countries. If you don't look, you don't find. They would like to imply, because they don't see anything, there's nothing wrong, but if they're not looking, they won't find. You often hear the promoters say things like, oh, we've been doing this for 60 years, if there's any problem, we would know about it by now. Oh, no, you wouldn't, unless you were doing the studies. Another issue that came out in 1997 was a researcher in England found that fluoride accumulated in the human pineal gland, and the pineal gland is a little gland between the two parts of the brain, the two hemispheres of the brain. It's not protected by the blood-brain barrier. It has a high perfusion rate of blood, and it also is a calcifying tissue like the teeth and the bones. And so this researcher hypothesized that fluoride would be attracted to this tissue, this little gland, like a magnet. And sure enough, when she investigated the average level of fluoride on these little calcium hydroxyapatite crystals was 9,000 parts per million, up to 21,000 parts per million, which means that this little gland has a higher concentration of fluoride than any other tissue in the body, including the bone. This researcher, Jennifer Luke, also did animal studies, and in the animal studies, she found that fluoride lowered the production of melatonin, the hormone that this little gland makes, and incidentally, it only makes it at night, the hormone of darkness. Uh, this pineal gland re reacts to light. It, uh, Descartes called it the seat of the soul. Not only did it lower melatonin levels in these animals, but also shorten the time to puberty, which is absolutely consistent. A, a melatonin is thought to be, act like a biological clock, involved with timing, timing of puberty, timing of aging, timing of a jet uh, lag and um, sleeping patterns and so on. Controls all kinds of things. And what they think happens that with a child, at birth, the melatonin levels are high, and with childhood, they gradually lower, and at a certain point, the lowered melatonin levels trigger the production of the sex hormones leading to um, puberty. Ironically, that first study that was published, which I already referred to in the bones, also recorded that the young girls in the fluoridated community, Newburgh, were menstruating on average five months earlier than the young girls in the non-fluoridated community. Now, they didn't think that was significant at the time, now, with Jennifer Luke's work, it is clearly um, had, takes on a new perspective. Kids now are reaching puberty seven, eight, nine. It has people very, very worried. But once again, the fluoridating countries have made absolutely no effort to reproduce Jennifer Luke's work. And it's not difficult. They could have done it easily. The Department of Health and Human Services has adopted to this, quote, sacred policy of fluoridation is to deny, 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 critique the methodologies, but don't attempt to reproduce the studies. If you don't look, you don't find. And they're using the absence of study as if it was the same as the absence of harm, which is absolutely ridiculous, utterly irresponsible. So now they're, they're giving every indication, particularly the center of disease control that avidly promotes fluoridation around the United States and around the world for that matter. The impression that they give is that it's more important now 
to protect this practice than to protect the health of um, the American people and our babies and our children. It's almost as if the teeth have become the most important tissue, the most important organ in the body, instead of our brains, instead of our thyroid glands, instead of our pineal glands, instead of our kidneys. Well, as Dr. Conant said, if you don't look, you won't find it. Well, less than a year ago, Harvard did look, and to repeat that uh, study finding, they found that in a city where there was fluoridation, they had three times the number of children who were characterized as mentally retarded than they did in the non-fluoridated city. And the non-fluoridated city had three times the number of bright children as the fluoridated city did. Uh, it's a very important study, and it's something that is part of the info war. If you understand what is involved here, you still have the capability to opt out of this forced medication. You do that by buying a filter.